Hello everybody, today I am reviewing the world's best selling car. That's right, it's not the Model T, it's not the Citroen 2CV, it's not the Volkswagen Beetle, it's the humble Toyota Corolla. Now personally I think calling it the best selling car in the world is a little bit cheeky because the Volkswagen Beetle, as an example, didn't really change dramatically in its production run, whereas the Corolla is now on its 12th iteration. However, you don't sell more than 50 million cars without getting something a little bit right. Even now, more than 1% of all cars sold in the world are Corollas. So what makes it special? Well, here in the UK, Toyota are using this car to push their hybrid tech. And as a result, at the moment, you can only get it with either a 1.8 or a 2.0-litre hybrid engine. There are a few trim levels to choose from. You have the base icon that apparently nobody buys. Then above that, you have the XL and the GR Sport. What we've got here is the XL, which is the more luxurious trim. The GR Sport, confusingly, doesn't really get you any more performance at all. In fact, what it does get you is rather subtle. And the differences between the two, I think, should be a lot bigger. The GR gets you a nicer dash. It gets you a heads-up display. It gets you a fabric interior rather than the leather and leather-like of this but otherwise not much separates them. If you weren't sure about that, it's only 25 pounds of difference between the two. The Toyota website also doesn't help you. In fact, I've brought along my friend Stuart who works for Toyota to try and explain things a little bit better. And I think Toyota themselves could do a better job. And the interior is a little bit of a mixed bag. And I have to say, I think Toyota might have played this one a little bit too conservatively. It's well known that I'm not really a big fan of touch screens and everything being digital, but I think they could have done just a little bit more to make this particular car feel a touch more up to date. This was introduced in 2018, yet it does feel like an interior considerably older than that. Up here in the middle, you've got the obligatory standard center display, which is okay, albeit a little bit basic, and the reversing camera is very low resolution, a problem shared, oddly, with the Civic Type R2. These seats don't even have electric adjustment, although they are very pretty, very comfortable, and actually quite supportive, a real high point. The steering wheel is festooned with real buttons, another plus, and all the switches, although they may not look particularly sexy, do feel quite nice. This being a Toyota should be pretty durable. The dashboard has a mixture of analog and digital instruments. You can do a little bit with it and it's okay, but handily, this screen up here is fairly easy to view, which means that you don't really need too much here. Overall then, I'd say the interior is functional, but compared with the Golf 8, I think it's unlikely to wow any customers, but traditionalists may be happy that Toyota haven't tried to reinvent the wheels. So here, it's very much a case of your opinion may vary. Size-wise, the Corolla strikes a really nice balance. It's usefully larger than the Yaris, but not so big that it feels daunting when driving around town or down narrow country roads. However, Toyota's hybrid tech does present a bit of a problem. You see, with the two-litre car in particular, boot space is not good. This has just over 310 litres, which is way short of the Honda Civic Type R that I had last week, or the VW Golf 8, which each have about another third of capacity in the rear. Now this is particularly poor because it's the two litre version. And with that, Toyota had to move the battery pack to the rear and it gobbles up some of your space. To put this into context, my Ferrari 430 has 250 litres of boot space, so I can't actually get any more in the back of this than I can in the front of that. In fact, it's so bad, it doesn't actually even pass the industry standard Maserati Quattroporte 5 front under tray test. A clear failure, I'm sure you will agree. Now, if you do want more space, there is an option, because Toyota also do this. Get in there, you as a sports tourer, which is the estate version. There's also a saloon, but nobody actually buys those. So if you do want a car with some room in the boot for your things, you should probably give that a look. And there is another pretty big issue too. You see, this car, as tested, is just over 31,000 pounds. That means it's within spitting distance of the Civic Type R I drove recently. It's as expensive as a VW Golf Mark 8 diesel with similar performance and with a few options on it. And the Golf has always been the really expensive one in the segment. It's a couple of grand more than a Kia Seed, which will be fully loaded and have more stuff even than this. So really to justify its place in the world, the Corolla really has to offer something the others don't. 
so does it. Believe it or not, cars like this are actually some of the hardest to review. Not just because I spend a whole week with it, then when I come to film my intro, it absolutely hacks it down, but because whenever I get any vehicle, what I'm actually really testing it on is how well it meets its brief. So take something like a Ferrari, that's actually in many ways a very easy car to review because it's got to be fast, it's got to handle well, it's got to look good, it's got to make you feel special. It's very, very clear what that car's remit is. Same again if you get, say, a nice big SUV. All I'm interested in is, is it comfortable? Has it got room in it? How bad actually is it on fuel? Etc. Etc. Small, cheap cars for young people with little one-litre engines, all I want to know. How many toys do you get for your money? Is it actually good on fuel? Can you insure it cheaply? Would you really want one? But cars like this really do kind of sit in the middle, and they're meant to be all things to all people. So I'm really not sure what it is someone would actually be looking for when they come to buy something like this. Luckily, that's when my friend Stuart came in, because for a long time he did work for a car dealership, specifically a Toyota one, and he gave me a little bit of insider info. The vast majority of buyers wanted this, the XL, and then they were sort of split between the 1.8 and 2 litre engines. Customers also weren't too interested in specifying a car, they just wanted one that was available now. That's the kind of customer that you're dealing with. So this one, in terms of options, doesn't really have much beyond the very nice Scarlet Flare paintwork. You can also get this in a two-tone with a black roof that looks really quite nice. The other options you could get would be a panoramic roof, something I certainly would have, and a JBL sound system, which apparently isn't a massive upgrade over the stock item, but it's only about 500 quid, so it's also not too pricey. For me, the real key bit about this car is that the hybrid system needs to be bringing something to the party in order to justify the price that Toyota are asking. The Honda Civic has a huge amount of room in it, and the Kia Seed has got loads of toys for your money, so this really needs to be the Toyota's trump card. And happily, the hybrid actually works really very well. I'd go so far as to say this is one of the best motor engine integrations I've ever experienced in a car. It's genuinely seamless and you hardly ever notice when the petrol engine actually kicks in. That's just as well because it kicks in a lot. There's some buttons down here, you've got drive mode, so you've got eco, normal, sport, and you've got EV mode on the right which will sort of lock the car into electric mode. The problem is the car doesn't really have a very big battery pack, in fact its official EV range is only just over a mile. This is a mild hybrid, not a plug-in, so there's no way of forcing charge into it at home. And the truth is that over about sort of 20 mile an hour, the petrol engine will kick in regardless of what mode you've got it in. So if you are somewhere where for whatever reason you can't actually drive a combustion engine car and you needed the hybrid element to be able to get you through that sort of zone, this is not the car for you. You need a real proper plug-in hybrid that should be able to get you a bit more electric only range. The car is actually surprisingly punchy too, 184 horsepower pulling a surprisingly light 1.4 tonnes considering you have got a motor, batteries, all sorts of stuff in here. Actually I think that's fairly well managed but that's probably in part due to the fact it doesn't really have too many batteries. I also, over the time I've had this car, managed to average nearly 51 to the gallon. And that's great, because it means the hybrid system is actually doing something. So many cars I've driven recently have claimed decent MPG, but actually nearly every single one I get in just does 30. No matter how I use it, where I use it, that's kind of what I seem to be getting. So if you do want an economical car and you don't want diesel, and that's actually a lot of people that I meet now, this really is a very good option. The 1.8, I'm told, will easily get 70 or more depending on how you use it, and that is absolutely sensational. But of course, there is a price to pay. This 2 litre, actually, I've quite enjoyed. It's very competent, it's got a bit more poke in it than you might think, and actually, I've had a little bit of fun with it. Outright grip levels are not that high, so when you do start to press on, you'll find the tyres giving up pretty quickly. I have a suspicion if you replace them with some sportier ones, you'd get on a lot better with it if you are a petrol-heady type. But of course, as an economically-minded car, it's got 
eco-friendly tyres on it. So that's certainly going to be causing a bit of an issue. Most drivers, I suspect, won't notice, but us petrol heads will. It's only when you really put your foot down that it becomes apparent this is a CVT-style box. Toyota have given you a sort of manual mode, so there are paddles behind the wheel, and if you shift the lever over into S, you can move it up and down, and it will change through the gears. Honestly, don't even bother. It's absolutely horrible when you try and shift that way. The car's just not happy, because what you're really trying to do is get a CVT gearbox to pretend it's not a CVT gearbox, and it doesn't actually feel like a normal auto. It still feels like a CVT, only it's very, very unhappy. So seriously, thank you Toyota for trying, but that is just not worthwhile. Same with Eco and Sport mode. I've driven the car around in both for a little bit, there isn't a massive difference between them, certainly not really in terms of economy. Sport mode apparently is a bit happier to use some of the electric charge to help you down the road. I think it weightens up the steering just a little bit as well, but not enough to really make a difference. And so I find myself in normal and quite happy for this kind of car. For the journeys I've been doing with it, that's absolutely fine. The fuel economy also means that the very small 43 litre tank hasn't been an issue at all. You could easily get over 400 miles out of this, which is sensational and much better than the Civic Type R I was driving the other day. Yes, I know that's a much higher performance car, but the fuel tank's only just a little bit bigger than it is in here. Oh, I did actually feel the electric motor kick in there as I was leaving a village. It actually held in electric mode up to about 30 mile an hour there, which is about as high as I found it realistically wants to go. It will coast occasionally, so I'm doing 40 downhill now and it, it's turned the engine off, but it's on and off all the time. If you put an exhaust on this, it'd be horrible because you'd forever hear the car switching on and off. Visibility is good, if not excellent. You have a B pillar here, which is not as bad as some I've experienced, but is still reasonably intrusive. The dash is also quite high. You don't really have any sensation of where the front end is. And this A pillar is annoyingly raked as well. Oh, there you go. A bit of wheel spin as we leave the junction. You can now hear that engine working itself away. This is, that's not foot flat. It delivers decent acceleration. It's quick enough, you know? It's actually surprised me how sprightly it is. But here, oh, nope, didn't chirp. I was surprised, I sort of thought it might. Oh, it's left hand up. We've got a bit of space, we've got visibility. Yeah, oh, that bong, I can tell you, is because it has detected the fact that my Maserati Quattroporte under tray is still in the back from when we filmed the intro and uh, it's very, very angry. Obviously, he thinks a child is trying to escape. There, that's a bit better. I slowed down and it sorted itself out, so it'll probably do it again in a bit. The base stereo is all right, not spectacular. This system up here is very out of date and a bit clunky to use, but it does tell you everything you need to know. The AC worked absolutely brilliantly. I have no issues whatsoever with that. And the displays down here, although they're not very fancy, do give you all the information that you need. The GR apparently does have a much nicer looking setup. It's only slightly different. The CHR, I think, gets a similar version and that I'm told actually looks a little bit more modern. Personally, I would have loved to have seen one of these with just really a six-speed manual gearbox, some sportier tyres and a, a very slightly different interior. I think that actually would be a car that us petrol heads would really genuinely enjoy daily driving. In terms of dynamics, the steering doesn't really have much feel, but it's direct, it's pleasant enough, it's weighted correctly for daily use. The brakes are a different matter. As a hybrid, of course, you have this regenerative element and you've got regular items on the car as well. It is fairly obvious when you press the pedal down when the regular brakes kick in because you suddenly feel a lot more resistance and the car actually does start slowing down quite a bit more too. It's a little bit odd first time around, but you do get used to it. And in actual fact, I've wound up using it to my advantage because you can tell when those regular items are being used. So actually in most scenarios, I've tried to use as much just regenerative braking as I can better for the environment, the car, etc, etc. You really do drive hybrids and electric cars a little bit differently. Whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not so sure. I think the major issue with a car like this for a lot of people is the fact that because it has a petrol engine still, they're a little bit worried that in a few short years they may be told it's just as redundant as the diesels they've only just been told to get rid of. 
And that is, I think, a genuine concern. I think government should really do a little bit more to allay people's concerns and say, look, no, no, we are going to keep these rules for this amount of time. People I know that say live in or very close to the ULES zone or other, you know, environmental zones in cities, they want to know if they're going to buy a car like this, is their investment going to be safe for a little while? This really is not the kind of car that any petrol head is ever going to actually, I think, properly fall for at a first glance. However, I can very easily see something like this being the kind of car that you have as the other car on the driveway, the thing that takes the kids to school, that you go shopping in occasionally, that you use for those big, long, boring trips where you just want something economical. And it'd probably be the sort of thing that after a few years, because I suspect it will be relentlessly reliable, you just... You'd kind of miss it if it was gone. This is a jack-of-all-trades kind of car, really, and things like the boot, I think, would be an issue for some, including myself. Although you would get a bit more boot space with the 1.8 and 120 horsepower sounds like enough, because of the way that that particular car works, you'll find the engine screaming at you a lot more than this one, and that is not something I think that I would enjoy that much. With that engine, the whole CVT bit does become a lot more apparent. The 1.8 is actually the Prius drivetrain. Incidentally, I do find it interesting that Toyota, despite being real pioneers with hybrids, has still been somewhat reluctant to commit to a full EV. In truth, cars like this do demonstrate exactly why they've been that way, because I think for a lot of people, this does what you need it to. This has delivered the improvements in fuel economy, CO2, etc. See, I got some flack recently because I criticised the BMW M340i for only achieving the same fuel economy as my old 330ci from about 15 years earlier. And a lot of people said to me, James, why are you complaining that a car with near 400 horsepower all-wheel drive is doing only 30 mpg well the fact is because it's got the hybrid system on it and the whole point of having a hybrid on is to actually improve things i suspect with that car if you took the hybrid away your fuel economy wouldn't really suffer whereas here i feel like adding the hybrid system has actually done something it also makes for a fairly pleasant drive i mean we're in ev mode now in fact the engine cut in again twice there and it's in again now and it's off now that's that's what it's like by the way and had I not been looking and seen the dial moving up and down for the revs, I simply wouldn't have known. Very, very good job, Toyota. I just wish you'd use a different kind of gearbox. <laughs> I really do. I would love to see one of these with a manual or a regular auto. Apparently, a proper GR version of one of these is going to be coming. Won't be as radical as the GR Yaris, but I'm told we'll have some of that car's mechanicals, not the all-wheel drive system, but it will have the engine and the gearbox out of it. So that, I think, would be a car to watch out for as a petrol head. However, for everybody else, this probably is a car worth considering. Check that it fits your requirements, because if it does, it may not be the flashiest thing inside, but I think it's going to be a very, very sensible choice. Not something I easily can recommend, but when it comes to a car like this, that I think is what people are after. So, there we have it. That is the Toyota Corolla 2.0-litre hybrid XL. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.